Hello once again, YouTubers. How's it going? Like and subscribe, like and subscribe. Um, I've been away for a few weeks, but we are back in the saddle now with another episode of the Swift Half of Snowden. If you've seen the show before, you know the deal. It's not particularly complicated. It's just a half hour conversation between me and somebody I'm interested in, and I hope you will be interested in too. This week, it is none other than Dr. Stuart Ritchie, his psychologist and lecturer at King's College London and the author of a book called Science Fictions, which came out last year, a very good book uh, looking at uh, all sorts of misconduct, hype and fraud in science and in psychology in particular, where it happens to be uh, especially rife. Stuart, how's it going? Very well, thanks for having me on. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, I wanted to start with something a little bit um, away from both our fields of, uh, of knowledge, really, just because it's topical, which is Afghanistan. I feel we have to kind of touch on it. Now, until about last Thursday, it seems to me that the consensus view amongst people who have high status opinions is that America and the UK should never have gone into these countries in the first place and should get out and Western imperialism and intervention never works. And now it seems like virtually everybody is a neocon. Now, as a person who is of high status yourself, can you explain this turnaround? <laughs> I think um, I think a lot of this is driven by the, the the Biden statement a few weeks ago, right? So we've been like bombarded with those videos of him saying three weeks ago, saying no, 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 no. There's no chance that the Afghan army will will be defeated by the Taliban. There's absolutely no chance at all. We've been building them up. There's three hundred thousand of them. Blah, blah, blah. And it's just in such sharp contradiction to what then immediately went to happen. I think nobody can look at that and say. This is this has all worked out very well. And I mean, if Biden had been completely honest and said, look, um, we I just want to get out no matter what happens, which I think I think is actually his opinion. I want to pull the plug. I want to I want to get out of this. I have watched this happen. I was against it back in the day. And uh, uh, now I want out now that I'm in charge. I think that would have been completely fine. But the fact he did that weird press conference. Uh, and said, no, 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 it's going to be fine. The, the, the Taliban will not take over. Or, or I think he said it's extremely unlikely or something. Um, so he did leave open a tiny possibility. But um, I think if he hadn't said that, there wouldn't be this, the, the contradiction. People would still maybe, the, the neocon leaning people would still say, this is a disaster and so on. But I don't think there would be that. Everyone like, everyone loves uh, to point out hypocrisy, right? It's the, it's the classic thing to point out. It's the classic thing to be offended by hypocrisy. And it, it, this seems like a kind of hypocritical thing. Like if he must have known that the Afghan army were in a terribly bad state. Either that or he was misled or deluded by someone. I don't know. It's, I, I think he was genuinely surprised by how bad the Afghan army were. I think he probably thought they could hold out for like three months at least. Well, but it yeah, was like it, three it, days. It made the French army in 1940 look like the Russian army in 1941. <laughs> yeah, it's true. It is, it is astonishing. And he did say in his speech the other night, that we were surprised by how quickly it happened. But I think... The, the fact that he made such a, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, he said it was extremely unlikely and stuff. And then there was another interview where the logic of it did seem quite callous. Like he said, which is a similar statement to what Donald Trump had said not long ago, where he said, I have zero responsibility if, if Afghanistan is taken over by the Taliban. And he even did that. He said zero responsibility um, uh, if, if the Taliban take over. And that did seem quite callous to a lot of people and, and quite, um, uh, you know, especially now that that is being played alongside videos of, Taliban people arresting people in the streets of Kabul and, 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 and so on. Well, let's stop talking about foreign affairs, Stuart, and talk about something that um, you know a lot about, which is IQ. Now, how about this for an idea, Stuart, Dr. Stuart Ritchie? What if taking IQ tests only shows you how good you are at taking IQ tests? Uh, have you ever considered that? <laughs> you know, once or twice I have heard that. Uh, amazingly cliched statement said, and uh, in fact, I wrote a whole little little paperback book trying to trying to uh, uh, address that statement, which is something that smart and uh, uh, you know um, uh, right thinking people do often say, and you see it pretty much every day repeated whenever anyone talks about intelligence tests and so on. And um, I think they have a really bad reputation, intelligence tests. And if you look at the actual evidence in psychology, I think uh, uh, they don't deserve that reputation. Um, or certainly, people assume that if you are interested in intelligence tests, that you have certain views or that you have certain political uh, uh, ideologies or whatever. Um, but actually, in fact, you know, just doing an intelligence test doesn't tell you just how good you are at the test. It tells you lots of stuff. Um, uh, certainly intelligence tests correlate with, or your score on in an intelligence test correlates with 
first of all, how you how well you do at school, uh, um, how well you do in the workplace, um, even aspects of your health. So um, uh, various aspects of of how well you do in terms of your um, physical and mental health and your lifespan, too. So people who score better on intelligence tests as children tend on average to be alive uh, later uh, in their life. They live longer. And so um, uh, uh, it's really, it's, it's far too glib to, to just throw out this thing about, oh, they're just little, little silly little puzzles that people don't, that, that don't really matter and only psychologists care about. Um, they do relate to lots of things in the real world. Now, of course, you then have to make the decision as to what you do with that information. And, um, uh, you know, there have been uses of them in the past, obviously, for, 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 for bad purposes, but they can also be used for perfectly benign things like making sure uh, kids um, uh, get the right uh, educational inputs that they that they uh, deserve, or uh, or that would help them most, or making sure people are given the right roles in an organization, or or even to go back to the previous topic in an army, you know, um, uh, uh, whatever it happens to be. So, um, uh, and also, you know, there's a really important thing happening right now in certainly in Western industrialized countries, which is people are aging. And we know that people's cognitive abilities, basically their scores on intelligence tests, their the type of abilities, decline with age. They get worse and worse. And we need to try and stave this off. We need to try and help people to hold on to their cognitive abilities as they age and as they decline. And how so, can we, how can we do that? Say again. How can we do that? Well, uh, uh, it's well, first. Well, first of all, we need to try and understand what's happening. So we have all these we have all these studies where, uh, uh, from the mid twenties, it seems people's uh, intelligence scores start to drop off, or at least some. Uh, abilities, so memory scores, reasoning scores, speed, things like your vocabulary and your general knowledge continue to increase and then kind of plateau later in life. So that's often like that's often called crystallized intelligence as opposed to fluid intelligence, which declines. Um, but the only thing that really uh, uh, comes up as a sort of um, a predictor of how of, of that slope in later life, right? So so how much you decline in later life um, is well, there's there's a couple of there's a couple of different things. First of all. There are certain uh, uh, genetic variants that if you have, it puts you at higher risk of having dementia, but it also puts you at higher risk of having uh, uh, faster cognitive decline, certainly in some of the studies that we've done. Um, and in terms of preventing it, uh, the only thing that really comes up in our studies is, is um, exercise. So people who are fitter um, and when they're 70, they can walk uh, faster, they can have a higher grip strength, they can breathe out more oxygen, implying that they've got healthier lungs and so on. They tend to decline a little bit slower. The question is whether if you actually made people do uh, 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 more exercise, like if you intervened and did a randomized controlled trial and made people do more exercise, um, uh, would that slow their cognitive decline? Or is it the case that there are just people who are just healthier throughout their whole life and they tend to decline slower, they tend to age you know, a, a less kind of precipitous rate anyway, just because they're, they're just lucky? Yeah, well, they're just different types of people. I was hoping yeah. you're going to say nicotine there and then you said physical exercise. <laughs> very disappointing. I think that might be the opposite effect, if anything. Really, I thought nicotine kept you kept your mind alert. Well, it's quite I mean, good on dementia and things. In the short term, if you're just talking about nicotine, if you're talking about smoking, then I think that's the bad thing. If you're just talking about nicotine, I, I don't think we have huge uh, amounts of evidence on um, the positive or negative effects of that of just that. You know, without the context of smoking. Yeah, I've never taken an IQ test because I'd really rather not know. I mean, I assume you have, by the way. Have you? I have. Um, you know what your IQ is. No, I have once taken one as part of an experiment that one of my colleagues did back at uh, uh, my old university at Edinburgh. Um, so he knows what my IQ is, but he's never told me. And there was always afterwards, there was always a slight awkwardness in the room that he yeah. knew what my IQ was. He knew that I knew that he knows what my IQ was, but I never asked him. We never talked about it. Really? You couldn't tell from his body language? <laughs> well, I didn't want to assume he, anything, but um, he, I, I certainly don't know what the number is. Uh, that I he, got did, he didn't want to upset you, though. No, perhaps. It was his decision, not Stuart, you don't want to know. <laughs> well, that's the worst thing. That's the worst thing. But yeah, I don't, I mean, I, um, uh, I, when you do this kind of research, you realize that like the one number is not, there's not the thing, right? It's a, it, 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 it varies a little bit from, from administration to administration of the, of, of, of the tests. It really, what we are interested in in this research is the kind of the variation among people, among a large sample of people. And if you give the same test to, to any of those individual people, again, they might get a slightly different score, but broadly people remain stable kind of across the lifespan. So we've got studies from uh, again up in Scotland where people had an IQ test when they were 11 and then again when they were 90 um, and they like the the correlation between their IQ at 11 and their IQ at 90 is far from a correlation of one but it's like a correlation of 
0.5 or just above 0.5 or something. So it's a, like a moderately strong correlation between how smart you are as a kid and how smart you are as a, like a, a very old right. person. Do you think the people who knock IQ tests and come up with that cliche question that I started with are people who've taken an IQ test and failed? I think it's well, not, not that failed. It's not really a pass fail thing. Yeah, yeah. But... Possibly, possibly. There is one prominent critic of IQ tests who uh, I have heard on the grapevine that he uh, um, has a very low uh, IQ. Did not get the, uh, the yeah, yeah the exactly. result he wanted. Well, not well. He got a, he got a low score, right? And so I think that might be a, re a kind of personal reason why he might not not like these tests. Um, but but um, but you know, I think generally people are uh, are concerned about other people. They don't want to. Uh, uh, they don't want to have the, you know, the kind of the rude, the, the rude feeling of telling someone that they have a lower uh, ability on a test. And it's a, it's a mistake. I think it's a mistake to attach value to a score on a common test, right? That's not what it's about. The test is about trying to um, uh, uh, assess where people are in, in a distribution. It's not about giving people value. And I think as soon as we criticize IQ tests for, for being like, is this, are you trying to say this is my me measure of worth or something? That's not what they're about, and no one should be saying that. And um, I feel like, you know, psychologists are hardly, you know, innocent of this. I mean, over the years, lots of psychologists have made a massive deal of how important IQ is, and it's the most important thing ever. Of course it isn't. You know, in, in explaining why some people do well and some people don't, there's all sorts of variables. I mean, just within psychology, you've got IQ, personality, charisma, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, just, you know, a lot of conscientiousness, pure luck, all sorts of other stuff like that. And then there's all the other kind of economic and social factors that, that, that all contribute a little bit as to how people do compared to others. Um, we do have this unfortunate focus on, you know, intelligence as the, as, the, as the important thing. But I think that's all the more reason to actually just look at what the research says. And what it says is that IQ tests are a moderately good predictor of lots of interesting life outcomes and they should probably be taken into account when you're trying to do this kind of uh you know trying to answer this kind of question but they're not the most important thing ever so you wouldn't be joining mensa then if you found out you had a high iq <laughs> i look i've nothing against uh, mensa and i think there's lots of cases where maybe someone for whatever reason hasn't been to university and they want to talk to other people who are smart i think probably the internet can help people with that now but certainly back in the day joining mensa sounds like a an, an idea to you know, maybe meet other people who are have similar interests. Who are or, smug. Well, who are maybe a bit smug as well. Yeah. What do people do in mental meetings? Do you have any idea? I do. You know what? Tomorrow morning, I have an uh, uh, an interview with uh, Mensa magazine, so I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you. Oh, really? After that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm doing. I'm having a chat uh, with with the, the the editor of Mensa magazine. Cool. Well, let's move on to scientific uh, fraud mm. and, uh, and and junk science. So you wrote this great book, um, Science Thanks. Fiction, which I gather has sold very well. It's, it's, um, it's done pretty well, yeah. Uh, out in paperbacks, isn't it? Paperback is coming out next month, so mid September. Excellent. And it looks at I mean, yeah, you can you can explain it yourself. I mean, various different forms of or various different reasons why you get bad untrue results often reported in the media sometimes it's the media's fault for overhyping them often uh, it is the researchers fault and there's various kind of perverse incentives for for creating bad science and it seemed i mean reading a book which is just one really bad example after another you get the impression this was absolute an abs absolute epidemic is I mean, how how big is the problem in psychology specifically? Before we move, well, on I think I, that was what I was going to say. I think it varies across different fields. There are some fields where the, the types of problems are are still present. I think the kind of problems of fraud and bias and negligence and hype and stuff are present in every field, and you keep getting examples of that, and you know, popping up if you follow. You know, there's a there's a blog called uh, or a website called Retraction Watch, which. Uh, uh, looks every time a paper is retracted from the scientific literature, and you know, there's examples across all fields. But in, you know, in psychology in particular, that's where uh, a lot of these bad incentives have really, you know, bitten really hard. Um, and also, I think the reason that we know how bad it is in psychology is because psychologists in the past 10 years have really started to kind of do a bit of self-examination, or at least some small subset of psychologists have started to do self-examination of, you know, are, are we able to replicate the findings in our field? Are we able to actually, you know, uh, go back and, and, and uh, pick a classic experiment that's been cited a thousand times and replicate it and, and, uh, and, and discover um, the same result again? And in about, you know, overall kind of very, very broad number, in about half of the cases, you can't do that. In about half of the cases, the um, the study turns out not to be replicable. You get either uh, uh, you don't get a result at all, or you get a much much smaller result than was published in the original 
paper. And so the question is, you know, what, why is that? And, and in the book, I talk about the kind of the four reasons why we end up in this situation, sometimes just because scientists have just made the results up, which um, uh, there's a really interesting example of that happening right now. Uh, um, just in the last couple of days, there's been another large scale fraud discovered in psychology. Um, uh, um, uh, and another reason is that the statistics, you can kind of put your thumb on the scale and just push the statistics in a particular direction that, that uh, are, you know, it's the sort of research that you want. Uh, another reason is that scientific journals tend to publish exciting, positive stuff rather than negative stuff. And the negative stuff, while real, gets pushed into the file drawer as, as, as the, you know, the metaphorical file drawer. Um, and then there are just just errors, just mistakes, just just screw ups, typos, copy and paste errors that scientists make that often have big consequences on their papers and are rife. If you know, there are these algorithms that search for statistical typos, like impossible numbers in papers, and they find them in huge proportions of papers, certainly in psychology. Um, other fields have not looked in as much detail, but I suspect there's no, there's no reason to think that it would be that much better in like evolutionary biology or some other some other field um and you know then i you know as, as you mentioned perverse incentives i talk about why we are in this situation and i think it's because scientists are pressured to do stuff that isn't necessarily discover the truth they're pressured to do stuff like publish lots of papers get lots of grant money get fame get uh, impact as it's called rather than focus on robust uh, uh results that actually are true yeah, and I, th I think probably of all those, and they're all big problems, when I was reading your book, the one that really stood out to me was the lack of interest in publishing null findings and the lack of interest in of researchers in trying to replicate stuff. You know, there, there's simply, it, there's nowhere near enough scientists dedicating their lives to falsifying other people's work, I think is what it comes down to. And I guess that's because there's not enough r grant money in that. But if that could be solved... I think a very large part of this problem would be solved, would it not? Yeah, I, I, you know, the, the, that's how I start the book. I talk about uh, when I was doing my PhD, we um, failed to replicate someone's results and we sent it off to the journal, the same journal that had published that original uh, result. And um, they told us in no uncertain terms, we do not publish replication studies ever. Like whether they're positive or negative, that's just not what we're interested in. We're interested in novel theoretical findings or something like that. I can't remember exact, the exact phrase. Um, uh, and I think that journal in particular has now changed its tune. That was 10 years ago. It's now changed its tune and it now says we, we want to publish replications. But uh, that is very much the attitude. It's very much, you know, when you're a, a journal editor, you want your journal to be publishing exciting new stuff that's really flashy and might get into the news and get a headline, you know, new study discovers this, this, this. Um, what you don't necessarily want to, you know, report is here's another thing, another study that finds the same thing again, because it's boring. But um, science shouldn't be about whether it's boring or exciting. Or there's a contradiction, right? Because we do want exciting, groundbreaking uh, 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 findings that are just kind of at the edge of, of, of what we know. We do want scientists to be pushing the boundaries. But we want to make sure that they're pushing the boundaries in a way that's actually reliable and not just, you know, coming up with complete noise results. So I think the kind of um, uh, issues that I talk about in the book, um, they, they pollute not just, you know, not just kind of standard everyday science, but they pollute the stuff that's at the, at the edge as well, the stuff that we really want. So, um, uh, yeah, you're completely right that the publication bias issue is, is, is really terrifying. And there are some reforms that we could make to the way that science is kind of generally done that would um, uh, push back against that, I think. There's also just far too many psychologists, wouldn't you say? I mean, there's too many academics in general, but there's especially too many psychologists. When I was at university, there were so many people doing psychology. And one of the problems is you don't do psychology at school, so you've really got no idea what you're getting yourself into. And people were doing it, as far as I could tell, just because they felt that they were quite good at sussing other people out, you know? Well, quite good at mind games and thinking and understanding things. There's all sorts of daft reasons you could do psychology without really knowing anything about it. And day one at university is the first time you taught anything about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, if I can, my, my, own, my own story is that I, um, when I finished high school, I thought I was kind of interested in science, but I kind of liked doing stuff with, that was to do with people. And so maybe psychology would be a good idea. Like I just drifted into it for that reason, not because I'd had any psychology at school or, or, or anything like that, just purely drifted into it. And I think that must be the case for a lot of people. Um, and I ended up sticking around, but, but clearly, you know, and I don't know if there's too many psychologists, but certainly the stuff that psychologists study 
is uh, uh, is often quite risible. The, the the sort of stuff that's been published in the psychology journals. Um, you know, we had we had years and years of social priming research, where mm. you know you had all these really ridiculous studies. That um, and my favorite one is one where there's a room and there's a cardboard box in the middle of the room. Uh, uh, you get the participants to go in and they either sit in the box or at the side of the box and they have to do a creativity test. And if they're sitting in the box, they get a lower creativity score, is what they found, than the people sitting outside the box because they were thinking outside the box. And the fact oh, that they were thinking outside <laughs> the box activated some kind of metaphor in their mind and made them more creative. That's what we're led to believe. Of course, completely daft, obviously ridiculous. And yet it's published in the psychology journal with a with a really big effect size and you know all the kind of standard statistical stuff that you would think would be done in a in a in a in a scientific field. But it's but it's just silly. It's just a waste of everybody's time. Um and uh, and yeah, there's 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 so much of that. Um and there's well, there's loads of that, especially in behavioral economics. I mean, a lot of the examples in books like Nudge are things like that. You know, we we took these Har it's always Harvard students. By the by this time the Harvard students must know there's an alternative, you know. <laughs> reason behind a lot of these studies but yeah we got the harvard students in and the ones who read a page of the bible before they did the test were more honest than the ones who did and all this kind of stuff i don't know if that was ever replicated or not but uh, probably there, not there have been some replications of that you know thinking about the ten commandments and all uh, that and and, uh, and the, the you know the talking about behavioral economics the or, or that kind of research that kind of nudging type research um just yesterday or the day before it came out that a very prominent paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences um, uh, was, well, the, the the investigators who are on this blog called Data Collada, which is a great another great blog to read if you're interested in statistical kind of takedowns of studies, statistical critiques. Um, they say that they think it's fraudulent. Um, and the idea of this study was that if you sign the um, the kind of the consent statement or the or the statement that says I am not, you know, everything here is true, if you sign that at the top of the page before you read all the stuff, then it will make you more honest than if you sign it at the, at the, at the bottom, right? That, mm -hmm. was the, that was the big finding. And that's been cited 500 times. It's a big deal paper. It's all over, you know, it's cited everywhere. It's, you know, I'm, I, people, um, I've seen tweets from people saying, you know, I, I worked in some organization or some government organization and we were actually talking about trying to move the, the consent to the top rather than the bottom. You know, people were actually trying to do something with it. And um, it turns out that the data were, or at least in one of the experiments in that paper, it reported multiple experiments, uh, were, were generated in a random number generator. So, uh, and there's, there's like clear signatures of this. And if you just, if you just graph the data out and just look at them, um, uh, someone at some point in the process has committed fraud. We don't exactly know who it is and it's difficult to work out who, 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 who did this, but it looks like that's the case. Unless there's some extremely unlikely explanation that comes out, I think they're going to retract the paper. So, um, and, and no one's ever tried to replicate that particular study, even though well, it's been cited hundreds of times. Interestingly, the authors themselves just published a negative replication, or the authors themselves with a new team of people who had been trying to replicate it. I think that's kind of where it came about, that people tried to replicate it, and they looked at the original data and said, well, wait a minute, this doesn't make any sense at all. So there's all this stuff. It's like a kind of minefield if you look back at the, the scientific literature. There's all this stuff lying there, which is just waiting to explode if you look at it or, or you know, if you if you step on it and just, just, just probe a little bit further than you should. You'll find stuff that's unreplicable. You'll find stuff that's fraudulent. I mean, even if you look back, I talk about this in the book, um, cognitive dissonance, right? The idea that uh, people don't like when they have contradictory beliefs and it makes them feel, you know, that they have to do something to resolve the dissonance and change the way they behave. And the original experiment that was published on that, and I think the 1970s, um, has numbers in it that, that are impossible, that can't possibly be true. So they're either a mistake or uh, um, something worse. Uh, and yet that idea has been around and has made such a big influence, uh, had a, such a big impression on sort of culture. The idea we, you know, everyone talks about cognitive dissonance. And my friend uh, Joe Hilgard summed this up quite nicely. He said that if you look back at the psychology literature, especially the stuff in the 1970s and so on, when they were doing social psychology, the prison experiment, you know, all that kind of stuff, it's a literature of ideas rather than a literature of evidence, right? The evidence is complete crap, but the ideas are sometimes quite cool. So cognitive dissonance and you know, the, the ideas of conformity and some of the other experiments and all that, they, they came up with fun ideas, but they didn't, they, they were either incapable or they didn't care enough about the empirics to actually properly test this stuff. So, um, uh, uh, you know, we've, as psychologists, when we look back at the, at the scientific literature, it really is like a, a very, very, very weak foundation for stuff. And, and, and I keep looking back at, uh, at papers that, that, that are cited in, 
popular science books or, you know, worse, you know, um, policy documents or whatever. And they, they just crumble to dust when you, when you pick them up. The Stanford Prison Experiment and the Milgram Experiment, probably, I would say, the most famous of yeah. those kind, kind of experiments. Uh, but both of those have been debunked now, is that right? Well, the Milgram one, I think, holds up a little bit more. Uh, there, are, there are kind of details, like if you look into the details of that one... It's you can't even big... explain what the Milgram experiment is. The Milgram experiment is the one where you, um, you have uh, uh, what seems like a participant, but actually they're your kind of stooge, they're your confederate, who's been hooked up to some electrodes, and then you get the real participant in, and um, they're doing a kind of uh, teaching thing where the, the person who's hooked up to the electrodes has to memorize stuff and repeat it back. And if they get it wrong, if they fail to remember it, the, the participant is to give them an electric shock. And the, there's, you know, the person is screaming in pain when they get an electric shock and, and the experimenter in a white coat is standing in the room saying, no, no, you need to keep shopping, shocking them. You need to keep continue. The, the experiment requires that you continue to shock this person. And um, uh, so the idea was that they would conform to that. And, and actually, I think, um, although there are some like questions about exactly how many of the, the people in the experiment realized that it was not the person really wasn't getting shocked, you know, they were just acting. Um, and, you know, some other issues that was replicated, like Milgram did that experiment on, you know, I, I can't remember, well over a thousand people over the years. I think I saw Darren Brown replicate it, actually. Yeah, there, were a, couple of, there like were a couple of like TV type things and, 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 and so on. I think the, the broad idea there that if you're in a situation and you identify strongly with, you know, I'm doing a scientific experiment and I should I should do this for science then you will do stuff <laughs> like right. you know you would look back and go actually this is a bad idea so i think that one's not quite as in a bad in, okay, in bad shape good. i think that's like the healthy process of debating what a scientific finding means the stanford prison experiment on the other hand which is philip zimbardo's experiment um has come in to much more uh, kind of disrepute over the years um so that one that was the idea where they turned the stanford psychology department's uh, basement into a prison and they got people to act as the the prisoners and they got people to act as the guards so it's a kind of fake prison and the idea is that as soon as you give people these social roles you know you're a guard you're a prisoner they'll start to act out these roles and um after just a few days, maybe less than that, uh, the prisoners were in terrible psychological distress and the guards were screaming at them and like withholding their food and withholding their toilet breaks and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, Zimbardo, Philip Zimbardo, the Stanford psychologist, has used this as a kind of a, 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 um, a really a, a, a informing social psychology theories about how roles, social roles inform uh, um, change people's behavior really, really rapidly. And um, the only problem is, there's been new evidence discovered recently. So, so some some uh, tapes uh, came out of um, Zimbardo essentially just telling the prison guards that they should act that way. Here's an idea. Um, why don't you really stop them from going to the toilet? Here's an idea. Why don't you do this? He, as the experimenter, seemed to have huge influence over what was being done in the experiment. So it was really like... It's almost like reality, reality TV, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, or a play or something. Like he was telling them, you know, you need to you need to act this role, and here's some ideas of how you should do it. It's not that the mere fact of being given the role changed their psychology in 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 such a strong way. And so that's not really, you know, the word experiment is used. It's not really an experiment in any way. It's kind of a just a thing which happened, an occurrence. It's not, you know, it's it's not it's not a, a, this kind of scientific thing which um, we we kind of are led to believe it is. So there's been some. You know, really strong critiques of that, um, and and, and it, but the underlying it, idea surely is right that well, know, pe people right? who are prison guards will become more brutal, and prisoners will start behaving a different way, and that's how you can explain the Nazis and all this kind of thing. Right, right. right. Well, that's that's the kind of the the, the 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 theories, right? But those are interesting theories, and and I think we're it's it's just like it's just like window dressing. It's that it's just like cognitive dissonance, and it's just like uh, conformity and so on. It's just like this thing that about the idea, the, the the literature of ideas. It's that we've got all these ideas which we came about through, we came to through just experience of human nature and yeah. history and so on. Why do we need to have this kind of pseudo scientific, you know, uh, a sheen over them? Like, oh, oh, I will actually science proves this. Well, well, no, maybe just uh, uh, you know, it's, it'd be perfectly fine to say that a reading of history shows this. Yeah, or, exactly. You know, yeah. An understanding of human nature shows this. It, it, it kind of devalues science to. To, to claim that there's this kind of, um, you know, uh, scientific backing for all our ideas, social ideas, political ideas, and so on. And I think, unfortunately, that happens, you know, still, it's not just 1970s social psychology experiments, it happens still right now, that we kind of point to a study, any study, doesn't matter what quality it is, 
to be, to back up our ideas when it, whether it comes to health. And obviously you've uh, looked into endless papers, which are extremely flimsy, but are used to back up a health, you know, some kind of sort of health belief that someone has, um, or whether it's politics or whether it's education or whether it's really anything else. Um, uh, and that's really what the book is about at base is, is, you know, we need to do as scientists, we need to do much better in, in, in uh, the, the quality of the research that we produce um, because you know, it's going to get used in the real world. Someone's going to point to that paper and, and justify something. Um, and if it's not a policy, it's they're going to sell a book uh, based on it or they're going to get lots of retweets. And it's all slightly polluting the the general kind of public uh, knowledge about stuff. And we want people to believe things that are real rather than believing things that are kind of probably in many cases just random noise and experiments. Yeah, maybe less of a problem in economics because the idea of even trying to prove anything in economics is uh, only kind of emerged about 20 years ago. Well, well, <laughs> but then we've got involved straight away with behavioral economics. You know? Well, I don't know enough about you know, macroeconomics and, and those kind of theories and stuff, but certainly the, the, the side of economics that fits in the, the, the microeconomic stuff, which is much more like psychology, I think if, you know, the, um, the, they've done replication studies in the same way, you know, they've kind of chosen 50 experiments to try and replicate. And, and I think it's like, Two thirds at most of them will will replicate well, and there's a huge chunk of experiments that they just can't find the same result, and that's in kind of economic type type research as well. Which you know, it, it really is psychology in a way. It's trying to understand how people behave under different circumstances, but um, but they have the same the same kind of issues, um, uh, but also the same kind of solutions. The, the the stuff I discuss in the book about changing the way we set up and publish experiments to try and improve the quality, um, uh, that you know, and, and the replicability of them. All right, final question, because I think we're coming up to our, our half-hour uh, finish point. Um, I had Sam Bowman on here a few weeks ago. I know you participated with him and indeed appeared in a, a photo shoot in The Guardian with him, <laughs> yeah. all masked up, um, about your, your, COVID, your COVID FAQ. Um, so go on, quickly, just tell us about that, how it, how it emerged. When I was at uni, there was this, um, uh, I, I got obsessed with debating creationists, um, uh, people who believe that the world is only 6,000 years old and uh, evolution didn't happen and so on. And there was this great website called um, uh, An Index to Creationist Claims. And it just had a list of all the things that creationists tend to say. There are no transitional fossils, for instance. And then you would see a link, uh, you would see an argument against it. And so you would be kind of equipped with that argument, should you encounter a creationist? And, you know, if you go looking, there are a few of them around. Um, uh, if you, should you encounter them, you can respond, well, actually, Archaeopteryx is a transitional fossil, whatever. You know, you can come up with the, the answer. And I noticed, and again, you've had a great experience of this, that the people making kind of COVID skeptic arguments were just repeating the same things mm -hmm. over and over again. They were repeating oh, yes. the same kind of arguments about false positives, the same kind of arguments about the uh, infection fatality. 99.9% survival rate. It, 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 exactly. Just Somewhere. repetitive, repetitive stuff. And I thought, well, wouldn't it be nice to have a similar website to that creationist one that equips people to argue back against these kind of arguments. So that was where the kind of idea came. And we also had a, a section of the site that kind of looked at some of the worst offenders in terms of people who are kind of producing these arguments and then repeating them in the press. But the FAQ section was, was very much to, not necessarily to try and convince the, the skeptics, because I think in many cases, um, they are too far gone, but, but, uh, but to, convince, to, to try and uh, uh, convince people or who are maybe in the middle, who have kind of seen the argument, why, maybe, it, 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 is it true that it's a 99%, a 99.5% uh, uh, survival rate? What does that mean? Is that true? What, what, what should I think about that? So we, we created this site to try and uh, do that and produce some, you know, some links uh, and, and so on. So people can kind of follow the, follow the research uh, uh, on that. So that caused lots of controversy. And I got lots of people with smiley faces, um, you know, uh, uh, on, as their avatars on Twitter, um, sending me very angry comments. They've now gone full anti-vax anyway. Yeah, so, it's slipped. It's, it's slipped. It's gone from lockdown skeptic to COVID skeptic to now vaccine skeptic. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's all very weird. I suppose the so we also had Freddie Sayers on a while ago, um, and right. I think he was suggesting that I might be I might be mistaken from some for somebody else actually on this. But if I'm if I'm misquoting you, Freddie, I apologise. But it's the kind of thing he probably would say <laughs> that you've been a bit a bit mean to some of these people that we all make mistakes it's all been it's been a learning process and that you should you should cut people like i don't know carl hennigan or, or gupta a bit, a bit of a slack because nobody's perfect how would you respond to that well i would respond that you know as a scientist your job is and it goes back to some of the stuff i talk about in the book your job is to uh, uh correct mistakes whether they're 
mistakes that are made by other people or mistakes that are made by yourself, you should uh, put your hands up and say, look, I got this wrong. Uh, or I have made a, a statistical error. You should be open to uh, critique. So when Carl Hennigan says um, that the Danish mask study, for instance, uh, um, you know, w was was were kind of def the definitive study uh, that, that masks definitely don't work and, and, and so on. You know, there are there are really important scientific critiques of, of the stuff he was saying there. And it would be nice if he was kind of open to that. But unfortunately, um, he and a lot of other uh, people who have, you know, who we kind of talk about on the website have repeatedly made the same claims over and over again, the same wrong claims over and over again and have not changed their mind. And I think changing your mind is the most important thing. So, um, uh, you know, uh, if, if any of these people want to kind of say, look, I got all this wrong, then we'd be happy to, to publish that on the site as well and say, you know, good, good on you. The problem is that none of them have. Not not one of no. them has has come has come out and said that thing where I said that that uh, fifty percent of the population had had caught COVID by May twenty twenty. I was way off. Sorry. Yeah, she still kind of recently doubled down on that. Double she? down, double down on that. Yeah, which just is is mind boggling to me. Uh, um, but there, you know, maybe she's got reasons for it and so on. She posted a very. Uh, this is Sumitra Gupta. She posted a a, a fairly brief. Uh, explanation of that on on uh, on unheard. If people want to look at that, they can. But I do find that rather unconvincing, um, and it certainly doesn't doesn't fit with how the the epidemic has gone. And then you know some slightly desperate things like saying when I said COVID was on the way out in in summer 2020, I just meant it was on the way out for that summer for the time it might not come back later and it's just a bit come on you know at least uh you can say look i'm sorry that was misinterpreted because obviously i was open to a huge wave happening in the in the winter mm. so um uh if that's if that's in fact what you meant so I'm, I'm not really convinced by the you know you're being hard on us thing um a lot of these people you know gupta for instance is the only scientist i've ever seen to have her pr agent's phone number in the um, contact section of a scientific paper that she uh, produced. So I don't think these are people who are kind of naive academics who've never encountered the press before and don't really think about, you know, don't really think about how they're perceived and, 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 and so on. I think these are people who are quite slick operators and can deal with a little bit of criticism. And it's a bit sad that they're, that they're now crying, oh, you know, don't, please don't criticize us. Um, when being criticized is what science should be all about. Yeah, well, I think when when the dust settles, we look back on this. There'll be a lot for psychologists to study by way of you know in, in extreme examples of motivational uh, motivated reasoning, confirmation bias, stuff like that. And maybe you guys can um, do that rather than committing lots of fraud. Well, <laughs> if only we had some good uh, uh, research, some good uh, material to work exactly, on. Point. Exactly. Yeah. Excellent, Stuart. Thank you very much indeed for Thanks, joining Chris. us. Uh, thank you at home for watching again. Uh, I'll be back, I imagine, in a couple of weeks' time. Don't know if I'll be here or at home or where I'll be. Maybe I'll even be with my guest in person. Who knows? But tune in in a couple of weeks to find out. As always, thank you to our generous donors who uh, give us money so we can keep producing this kind of content. If you want to support us as a think tank, let's go to IEA.com org.uk slash donate if you want to support the digital work specifically we've got a patreon i can't remember what the address is probably something like ia.org.uk slash patreon we would google it it won't be hard to find i'm sure so if you want to give us a few quid for um for all our videos and other online work please do um and take care of yourself next fortnight goodbye